Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's special guest is a legendary choreographer and theater director whose spectacular career has had one sparkling highlight after another. He started out as a dancer and actor and appeared in a number of original Broadway productions, including West Side Story, The Music Man, and Donnybrook. On Broadway, he choreographed numerous iconic musicals, including Funny Girl, Sweeney Todd, On the 20th Century, Merrily We Roll Along, and A Doll's Life. On the stages of London's West End, he choreographed the original production of Evita, and he's directed productions of Funny Girl, Kismet, I Do, I Do, On a Clear Day You Can See Forever, Jesus Christ Superstar, and so many more big shows that toured throughout the United States and Europe. He has staged and choreographed both the Tony and Emmy Awards. He's worked with everyone from Barbara Streisand and Angela Lansbury to Elizabeth Taylor, Hal Prince, Patti Lapone, Madeline Kahn, Michael Bennett, and so many more. He won two New York Drama Desk Awards for his work in Sweeney Todd and Evita, which also earned him a Tony nomination. And he won the LA Drama Desk Award for his choreography in Evita. I'm truly honored to welcome the incomparable Larry Fuller to our show. Larry, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for asking me on. I really enjoy doing this, Harvey. I do too. Larry, <laughs> when I was reviewing some of your career highlights just now, I was literally getting goosebumps. Are there times you have to pinch yourself to believe that this little boy from Missouri, who started out in Miss Zoe's dance class, grew up to have the life and the career that you've had? Wow, you've really done your research, Miss Zoe. <laughs> anyway, yes, actually, sometimes it's overwhelming when I really think of it. I remember you saying the little boy from Rolla, Missouri, in the late 60s, I was directing and choreographing every summer for the Goober Ford and Gross Music Festival. And they had eight theaters that were up and down the East Coast. And I was sent to LA, Los Angeles, and I was staying with another choreographer, Tony Sharmley. I was his house guest. I had Jane Powell and John Erickson and I Do, I Do. And Jane Powell would come and pick me up every morning in her Jaguar. And <laughs> I was like, I got to remember one morning I was standing out waiting for her. And I said, well, little boy from Rolla, Missouri, this ain't bad. An MGM star is coming to pick you up so you could direct her. That was just, I don't know, it was one of those triumphal moments. <laughs> uh, you've had so many. Now, I, I know that your transition from being a dancer to a choreographer was initially the result of replacing Carol Haney, the choreographer for Funny Girl, when she got sick and passed away, which is such a tragedy. But do you it think was. you would inevitably have become a choreographer and a director, even if she had not taken ill? You know, it's the road not taken. I'm not really I'm not really sure because when Carol asked me to be a dancer in the original Funny Girl, I said to her, Carol, I would love to work for you again. I always love working for you, but I wanted to be more than just a dancer because I was getting, I was in my mid twenties and I was thinking, you know, how much longer are you going to do this? You're going to turn into a dresser or something. So not too sorry about that dressers. Uh, <laughs> or you could have opened a dance school, I guess. Oh my God, no. And so I said to her, I would, I would like to be your assistant if possible. And she said, well, you can be my second assistant. I already have an assistant who will not be in the show. His name was Buddy Spencer. But you can be my second assistant and dance captain. And I thought, okay, great. Well, how would you ever know that would lead to me inheriting the show and, and doing it? At the first national company and the London company with Barbara, uh, and that kicked me off. And I just discovered that I did it well and that I enjoyed doing it. I believe the first Broadway show you ever saw was Damn Yankees with Gwen Verdon. Am I right? How did you know that? My because God, I do you? my homework. You sure do. I can't imagine somebody wrote that down. Yes, it was. The first week I was in New York, it was 1956 the fall of 1956, and a friend took me to see Damn Yankees, and Gwen was still in it. And, you know, I had died and gone to heaven. She was so amazing. Well, Gwen Verdon is my favorite dancer of all time, and you worked with her in Redhead, didn't you? I did, yep, for several months. Well, um, I've been dying to ask you this. 
I'm wondering if you saw the TV miniseries about Bob Fosse and Gwen Verdon starring Michelle Williams. I, I want to know what you thought of it. Okay. H having known both of them and worked with them, you have a, you know, a personal impression. And I thought that Michelle Williams was absolutely wonderful. Sam Rockwell, I was a little iffy about. He didn't seem to have the essence of Bob until the last two or three segments. Then I started to believe him as, as Bob Fosse. It just took him a while to get there. <laughs> now, you were in the original Broadway production of Music Man starring Robert Preston. And I read somewhere that Cary Grant was being considered to play Professor Harold Hill in the movie. I'm so glad they chose Robert Preston to do the movie, aren't you? I am. I have a story about that, by the way. Oh, please tell us. We were at the Majestic Theater where Phantom is now. So I, I used to go up and watch things quite often, just out of curiosity and also because I, there were parts of the show I just loved. And so I would stand in the wings and watch it. And there in the wing, only he alone and me was standing a tall, obviously good looking man. I could only see him from the back in a, in a beautiful suit. And I went, as I got closer, I went, oh my God, that's Cary Grant. <laughs> and he turned and looked at me and kind of bowed his head like, hello. And I went, hi. And I saw him standing there watching Bob Preston. And then later on, I heard that he told the producers of the film that he would not do it. They would be crazy if they didn't get Bob Preston. And they did. That's amazing. I, I know that Jerome Robbins and Jack Cole were two of your mentors, and I will be asking you about Hal Prince in a few minutes, but did you have any other role models and mentors that guided you throughout your career? Hmm. Well, Jerry, Ro Jerry Robbins was the genius master of all, and, and he was really my idol, as well as several other people's, including Michael Bennett. When I was in West Side Story, I was the jet swing, which means the general dance understudy. I would go on for people when they couldn't dance and they could do the rest of the show, but they were injured or something. So I danced for everybody in the show, except for Riff and Tommy. I was on one night when Jerry came to see the show. It was a few weeks into the run and we had a note session after. I was the first dance onto the stage because I wanted to be closest to God. We were sitting on the floor, the whole company, and he was standing, walking back and forth. We were getting notes, went on and on and on, and maybe 45 minutes. And during it, I remember him turning to Carol Lawrence, who was sitting there with a little pad and a pencil. And he said, you, fake, fake, fake. And every time he said the word fake, she'd write something down and then look up at him like anything else. I mean, she was obviously used to it. At the very, very end, I was thinking, oh, I made it through. He, he liked me. And he turned to me at the very end. I remember I was sitting downstage left. And he said, you, you stuck out like that with a sore on it. And that was the end of the note session. I was so, I mean, I was shredded, shredded. I, I knew that I was going to be fired. And I said to Ruth Mitchell, I guess I'm fired. And she said, no, no, you're not fired. We just have to make you more of a jet. That's the best advice you ever got, because instead of concentrating on the accuracy of the steps, you focused on being a jet. You got it. It really was a great, great note, and I didn't get fired. And then years later, I was told by Hal Prince that Jerry Robbins told him he really was admired my work in Evita and Sweeney Todd. And then a little after that, he recommended me to direct my first big musical in London. And I got the job because of Jerry. So there you go. From being a sore thumb, you became a thumbs up. <laughs> yeah. When I was doing my research, I learned that you went to Marquette University in Milwaukee for a year and you studied business administration, which surprised me because it's clear you wanted to be a dancer your whole life. So who pressured you to go to university? My father. When I, got, when I graduated high school, I was 17. And I was planning to go to New York then. 
And my father said, no, you're not. You're going to college. So I had no choice because I wasn't of age. So they sent me to Marquette University in Milwaukee, good Catholic Jesuit University. And I decided on my, uh, what, what I would study, so to speak, uh, because they wouldn't let me do theater or anything like that. I had to do something practical. So I decided business administration was kind of the most inane thing I could think of to study. Yeah, and, but when you turned 18, you went to New York and you never looked back. Correct. <laughs> I did. I never asked him for a cent, even when I was eating hot dogs and cereal because I had no money. And he acknowledged that when he came to New York and the, the rest of the family for the opening of On the 20th Century. And he did say, bless his heart, you know, son, you were right. You, you did what you really wanted to do and you didn't let anything stop you. And you never asked me for a cent. And <laughs> I, I respect you highly for that. It was nice for him to say that. Oh, very. He was proud of you. Yes. Well, now, of course, I have to ask you about working with Barbara Streisand in Funny Girl. I don't know how she could stand working with Garson Kanan, who was such a terribly frustrating director. Thank God he was replaced by Jerry Robbins. But what was Barbara? Got that. <laughs> what was Barbara like back then? OK, Barbara was so focused, so laser focused on on success and, and making the role work for her. I mean, speaking of Garson Kanan and his direction, uh, he couldn't direct traffic as far as I was concerned. <laughs> he may have been a good playwright and been able to move two or three people around the stage, but he certainly wasn't capable of doing a big musical. Anyway, we had two empty theaters we were rehearsing in. One was the Winter Garden and the other was the Broadway. And the Winter Garden was where Garson Kanan would work with the principals and the Broadway was where uh, the group numbers and the dance numbers and so on would be rehearsed separately and then put them together. So for some reason, I guess maybe because I was dance captain, I don't know, I had to go over to the Winter Garden Theater one day, just me, and Garson Kanan was rehearsing a scene which never ended up in the show where Fanny was coming into her cheap hotel room followed by Nikki Arnstein. And evidently from the dialogue, she was very, very nervous. She didn't know that he was coming and there he was and so on. And she had two bags of groceries and she would hide them in various places because they weren't supposed to eat in the room. And Garson Kanan said, uh, you got all the props ready? Okay, stage manager, okay, all right, let's go. So they came in with absolutely no instruction whatsoever. Uh, oh, and he did say to her, uh, just hide all those groceries in odd places, wherever you can think of to hide them. I guess he was hoping that she'd do something hysterically funny. And they did it. Thank God they knew their lines. And he said, okay, fine, let's get ready again. Set the props, so on, so on. Okay, do it again. And he had them doing it like over and over and not giving them any direction. I mean, it was just weird. No wonder she felt like she was on the edge of a cliff, ready to fall. But you um, say she was so laser focused. Could you tell back then that she was destined to become a major superstar? I think everybody thought she would be very successful in the role, yes. And she was amazing. She was only 20 years old. Yeah, I mean, is, she's a phenomenal performer. I want to ask you about working with Patti Lapone, who starred so brilliantly in Evita. Tell us about helping her build up her confidence so that she could take on such an iconic role. Well, Patti, of course, was known as an actor, not a singer, even though she'd been in musicals and sung like Meadowlark and The Baker's Wife. She was very full of, of, of energy and ambition. You know, I remember when we started rehearsing, I, I was... I took her alone to do a uh, big song and dance number, her big number at, in act one called What's Do Buenos Aires. All the dancers were in it and her. And it was an eight minute kill yourself dance number behind her singing and different things happening. It was like a big ballet. She and I were working and I was doing the staging with her 
And she, and you know, I give her an idea about what, what I thought, where this character came from at this point and why I was doing it this way or that way. So she was just so excited that when we'd start to run it after she knew the moves, I could see her eyes like a slot machine, Brrr, all these various things she was trying to play all at the same time. And I said, Patty, 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 you can't do it all at once. Come on, just pick one. And if that doesn't work, we'll pick another one. <laughs> so she, that's how excited and, and wanting to please she was. So we got along great, no problems whatsoever. Uh, she did have her problems with Hal, but that was kind of later on. She had vocal trouble too. Yeah, I've heard that. Is it fair to assume that Evita was your favorite of all your shows? Absolutely. Because it not only gave me the only show out of the five I did with Hal that had a group of dancers in it. The others had a lot of big staging and a little bit of dance here and there, but they, there wasn't any like dance number in five shows except for Evita. And not only did it give me a chance to do that, but it also gave me a chance to do some very interesting abstract staging because we were doing it in a style that was metaphoric, poetic, so that the visuals on stage helped to tell the story. You didn't get it all from the lyrics and in a sung through piece, people don't really hear all the lyrics. I mean, they hear them, they don't know what the word is. And I did about 50% of the staging of that show and had a great time doing it. And it how was spectacular. I saw her in that show in London. It was spectacular. And what you did was spectacular. What a, what a production. Yeah, it was. And how rare it is that you get to do something that is artistically fulfilling and a commercial success. Uh, that doesn't happen very often. No, uh, that leads me to ask you, you were the assistant choreographer in the 1977 film, A Little Night Music with Elizabeth Taylor. What was mm -hmm. she like to work with? She would run hot and cold. She wasn't difficult, really, except that she really wanted to know you knew what you were doing and you could do your job and that it wouldn't take forever to get it done. She was, a, you know, God knows she'd been doing films since she was a little girl. So she would only do like two takes three if something went wrong but she wasn't a one of those people that required 15 20 takes she wouldn't do that when the camera was rolling there she was so that was elizabeth taylor when it wasn't rolling it was elizabeth and it was at the time when she first started getting heavy we rehearsed for three weeks in the theater on Vienna, theater of vienna that was when Pat Birch, the choreographer, could be there. But because the film had been postponed and moved from Munich to Vienna, we were three or four months behind getting started. So Patty Birch could, could only do the three weeks of rehearsal. And then she had to leave because she had a job staging a national tour of Greece, which she had originally done. And so that's why they needed me to be there to help put her work on film with Hal. But on a, a little night music, it's not a dance show in any, by any means. Although Steve wrote words to the uh, night music waltz, which opened the show, uh, the film, where each character would have a, you know, like four lines or so to say who they are and what they want. It was kind of like a rondelet waltz around each other and through each other and so on, nothing difficult. And that we had to stage, uh, which took several days because nobody was a dancer. We also had a, a dance double for Elizabeth, who, thank God, really learned her part because just before we started to film, Elizabeth broke a toe. When she came in, she had a, a skin graft on her inner, one of her inner thighs from an ac a motorcycle accident. And then she got there and she couldn't do anything but sit with her foot up on a box or something. And then finally, when she got okay that she could move around, like the last week of three, she broke her toe. 
dancing, doing a little waltz across the stage. She caught her shoe in a crack in the stage and broke her toe. And so then we had to whittle it down to, she only did a few of the things we had planned for her to do. And the rest of it had to be done in a long shot with her dance double. Boy, oh boy, <laughs> are you creative, I'm telling you. Now you worked with the wonderful Madeline Kahn who starred in On the 20th Century. She had a reputation for being mean and a little paranoid and she was off sick a lot. What was the problem with her? Paranoia. She just was insecure, poor baby. She wasn't mean. I didn't think she was mean at all. She was just scared. But what was scared. she scared of? She had been on Broadway before that show. That's, I don't know. That's what I thought. I can't figure this out. Why doesn't she know? She's been on Broadway. I saw her on Broadway. She was a chubby comedian who could sing in like the late 50s. Uh, in New York. She was in, there was a place called Upstairs at the Downstairs. They had the upstairs, they had a review, which was very, very popular because they had some great people. It was kind of like Saturday Night Live. Lily Tomlin was in that and Madeline was in that and a few others that you would know. Anyway, they were just starting out and I saw her in a Broadway review uh, also. And then we, when I saw her in the first movie that she did with Mel Brooks, I couldn't believe it was the same woman. I mean, she'd slimmed down, they glammed her up, and it was amazing. So I think what her problem was is she always saw herself. You know, this happens also with beautiful models who, who grew up feeling like they were misfits. They never forget the image of their childhood. And I think she was just very insecure about playing glamorous women when she thought of herself as this pudgy little comedian. Example, we were in Boston at the Colonial Theater, the best theater outside of New York City. And there was a number in it called Veronique where she auditioned for Oscar. And at that point, her name was Gladys Platt Fat. I don't remember, some stupid funny name. and. During the audition, it became the show. So she obviously got the role. And she was playing Liberté uh, with the torch and so on. There was a point in it where she had a midi dress on and it, it broke away. They pulled it off of her and underneath was the Liberté outfit. And when we got to that point in the number, I, it was just her and me, nobody else, because I would, I would stage the numbers with Judy Kay and I would teach them to, to Madeline all by herself because of her insecurity. And then when she knew what she was doing, I'd put her in with the rest of the cast. I, we came to this point where her midi dress would be broken away and she would be standing there in a rather revealing costume with her legs bare, well, not bare, but out. And she was standing there on two feet, kind of a little bit splayed. And I said, no, no, Madeline, when they take the dress off, stand on one leg and put the other foot next to the standing leg and put your knees together. And she said, in other words, bevel. Uh, and she said, why? And I thought, she's been on the stage for how long? She doesn't know why. But I said, yeah, because it'll make your legs look better. And she said, my legs, my legs. What's the matter with my legs? I knew I shouldn't let them put me in this costume. It's too short, it's too, oh, she got so upset. She left the stage. The rehearsal was over. Oh, the poor thing was so insecure. I felt really bad for her. I wasn't mad at her. I just felt so bad for her. She wrote me a note opening night in New York, apologizing for the behavior. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I want to ask you about Stephen Sondheim, who we recently lost. You choreographed Merrily We Roll Along and Sweeney Todd, both on Broadway and for the 1982 TV movie. Do you have some favorite memories of working with uh, Stephen Sondheim? Oh, a couple of stories. <laughs> no, Steve was, Steve was, he wasn't warm and cuddly as a person by any means. He was a little standoffish. I never quite got through his veneer. 
because when I would have a creative idea, I would go to Hal because I was the choreographer. Hal was my director. So I, I, that's the proper uh, route for information. So I'd go to Hal and then if he wanted to act on it, he would go to Steve. Anyway, we were, you know, we'd, we certainly spoke, but we weren't friends. On Merrily, when I was called in to replace Ron Field, it was during previews. And so I was doing, it was like summer stock. I was doing a number a day and put it in. I, I redid all the staging except for the JFK, Frankly Frank review in the second act, which couldn't touch it was so beautiful we'd meet every day we being Hal and Steve and myself and the musical director an hour or so before the cast would come in for rehearsal and I would go over what I was going to do that day uh, with them so this one day was time for now you know which is the end of act one and the whole company is on stage and Franklin Shepard the main figure in the story is in the middle of it all and they're all and he's just had a wife leave him and things aren't going so well and all the whole company is singing little couplets and things four lines and whatever from either side of the stage at him saying you know put your dimple down now you know you know get with it life isn't what all roses that kind of thing and so i said to steve you know right there there's whoever sings this four lines, they're on stage right. And I would like to switch it over to somebody on stage left to get the attention over there because something important is going to happen over there. And he said, oh, no, you can't do that. And I said, I, well, but, but why? I mean, it wasn't specific to any character as far as what the lyrics were. And he said, oh, because that's not their rhyme scheme. You mean I every said, character had their own rhyme scheme? That's what I said exactly. I said, you mean every actor on that stage has his own rhyme scheme? Yes, well, of course. Okay, that's beyond brilliant. That's actually obsessive. Uh-huh. I looked at Hal and I said, did you know that? And he kind of looked back at me with a little sheepish grin and shook his head. <laughs> I believe it was because originally, I wasn't in on it originally, when they started rehearsal, every single person in the show had a character and they all had, I guess, lines that identified them as that character. And as it went on, they kept, you know, cutting, 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 cutting little things to get to the main story and give that time and get, take all the other fluff away. So everybody on stage had a character name. And I assume that when he wrote the score, thinking they would all be identified by the audience, that everybody would have their own rhyme scheme. Although you couldn't tell, I didn't get it. I mean, I looked at the lyrics after that and I thought, where's the rhyme scheme? It's in his head. But... <laughs> I think he credited I the audience with being a lot more intelligent and, and, <laughs> and perceptive than they really were. Yeah. Now, what about Angela Lansbury, who starred in Sweeney Todd, both on Broadway and in the TV movie? What was she like to work with? Angela was an angel. I loved her. Loved, loved her. She's just an actor. She has no star bullshit or, or ego. You know, she comes in, so let's go to work. I'm rolling up my sleeves. And she's just an actor there to do their job. I started immediately the first day with Worst Pies in London, where, which is her entrance. And I had to stage that. Hal had warned me, thank God. And then in the afternoon, we started rehearsing what was called the Lunt Fontaine then. I'm not even sure what name it has now. It changed two or three times. Anyway... And they had a big lounge, so we had a place to work away from the rest of the company. And we started on that. And every day we'd get, I mean, Steve wrote it like a straight jacket. He told you in the lyrics what the staging was. Because what he was, she was saying, obviously her action had to go with. And of course, it's, it's machine gun lyrics. And she had 
all these props, a roller and dough and flour and a knife and all these things that she had to handle. And I would work with her every day for about an hour and a half, two hours until I'd see her eyeballs start to roll up in her head from, you know, mental exhaustion. So finally, at the very end, the last day in the week, she did it through perfectly. Not one mistake, not one lyric missed. And I said, Angela, Angela, oh, that's great. You just, you did it great. And she said, well, yeah, I was okay. But, but you know, there's eight bars there in the middle. Well, don't worry, I'll fill that in later. And I thought, what the hell does she mean? And then, because she had done everything, absolutely clockwork. And I thought, she probably means there were eight bars where she was Angela Lansbury. She wasn't Mrs. Lovett. <laughs> she had to get that character into those eight bars. I don't, that's the only thing I could figure out. <laughs> she was amazing. In 1983, you directed a show in the West End called Marilyn the Musical about the life of Marilyn Monroe starring Stephanie Lawrence. I never understood why the show never came to New York because I think it would have been a huge hit in America, don't you? I do, because all of the Americans that saw it in London loved it. We were a victim of, of, of British chauvinism, actually. That is the, is the show that Jerry Robbins recommended before. The producer was Elliot Kastner, who was a film producer, really, mostly. He wasn't, he's an American, but, but he had a big, long affair with a British woman who was from high society or something. And there had been a huge, huge scandal in the papers and he fought with the press. So we were battling bad press to begin with. So what happened was they gave the writers terrible, terrible reviews. They gave me really good reviews, thank God even a couple of ingenious ones, but they tore the, the material apart. And I knew the material wasn't fabulous, but it certainly wasn't terrible. It's well, just a I shame was. that the show never came to New York. I think okay. it would have been a huge success. The bad, terrible reviews. And so the A crowd didn't come. And it ran about four or five months and lost all its money. Yeah, that's a tragedy. Now tell us about... Hal Prince, you collaborated with him more times than I could count. You were extremely close with him. What do you think was the secret to his genius as a director? His excellent taste. Really? He had great taste. He wasn't that hip up on working with actors one-on-one. -on -one. He, he expected the people that he hired to do their job and not and that he didn't do it for them. If they were in trouble, he'd help. Like Elaine Page was a bit in uh, at the beginning of during rehearsals for, for the original Vita. It, no, his great taste. And he certainly knew how to block a number, big numbers. He would, we'd work on them together. And then I would m musicalize them more once they were on their feet. Not on, I mean, certainly we had our separate things that we did, but sometimes we worked together on a number. And like the opening of the second act of Sweeney Todd, God, that's good. All those characters are down there at that big, long picnic kind of table demanding more meat pies. And uh, Mrs. Lovett is divided attention between them and, and Sweeney ha having the chair delivered and testing it out and so on. So Hal did the stuff upstairs in, in the barbershop and I did all the stuff on the stage. And that's how we would, you know, sometimes divide things. He was just such a great collaborator. He was really wonderful to work with. Yeah, you really created magic together. And then magic struck twice because you had an immensely important connection to another Broadway genius, Michael Bennett, who was taken from us far too soon. Tell yes. us some, some special memories of your relationship with Michael. Well, I mean, it's been printed in many books that Michael and I were lovers, which we were for a little over four years. Wasn't he a bit I wild for you? Well, he was very, very young when I met him. He, I was 25 and he was 20. I met him at 
of all places, the Roxy Bowling Alley, because uh, at that point, the uh, different Broadway shows would, people would come from that show and kind of form an impromptu bowling team. And we'd bowl different shows, we'd bowl each other. Nothing serious, just fun and giggles. And and I remember this one night I was there and uh, Bob Abian, who I knew from a da- has a dancer knows a dancer and bob w- was a good friend of michael's and they were at the bar they weren't bowling and bob called me over to, in- to introduce me to michael because evidently michael wanted to meet me and sparks flew so <laughs> it was like dingy it just happened almost immediately so we didn't live together for a year because i said i don't want to live with you until we've been at least a year out in our relationship because I've made that mistake before when you start doing domestic life together too soon. And after a year, then we looked for an apartment, we found one and we started living together. And I remember Michael, of course, being the only dancer I ever knew who came to New York not to be a star. He didn't want to be Gene Kelly or Joe Stair. He wanted to be Jerry Robbins, the choreographer director. And I remember saying to him, well, Michael, I'm sure you'll be a great choreographer, but come on, Jerry Robbins, really? (laughs) How wrong was I? Well, he certainly equaled Jerry Robbins in his accomplishments, that's for sure, and talent. Yes. Michael was a genius of sorts, I think. Uh, Although, of course, I didn't know that when we were living together, we were both still chorus cuties, as I say. We were both dancing in groups. Well, I'm that. surprised, you know, I had to chuckle because a lot of people don't know that you were on the last Perry Como show, the last Gary Moore show, and the last Ed Sullivan show. And Sullivan, where did you get that? Oh, I know it because some people think, oh my God, he's the kiss of death. But how did I've you manage to so do many, that? I've said that so many times. I said, you know, I was on the last Gary Moore show, weekly show. I was on the last Perry Como weekly season. And I was on the last Ed Sullivan show. If you wanted your show to die, just hire Larry Fuller, <laughs> the kiss of death. Well, but, you weren't the kiss of death to Michael Bennett. No, no, no. So, now, you know, you grew up in an era when being openly gay, even in the show business community, was fraught with personal and professional risks. And whether you know it or not, you were a role model for the gay men of my generation who had very few people we could look up to, Larry. So I just want to thank you for the courage you've shown throughout your whole life and simply being your true, authentic self. Thank you. You're very welcome. I have no idea I was a role model. My God. But can Um, you see how people of my generation would see you that way? Yes, because when I was in the in the late 50s when I came to New York, early 60s and so on, certainly anybody working in a regular job could not let it be known they were gay. It was taboo. They could get fired or people would treat them badly. God forbid that their family would find out, you know, that kind of thing. And me being in show business and a dancer at that, I mean, I knew I was gay when I was 16. And so I just lived my life and nobody seemed to care. You know, he's a chorus dancer. Yeah, well, he's gay. There are a lot of them are. So I I just lived openly all the time. Michael wanted to be like Hal Prince, I think, as far as, okay, family, producer, director, choreographer, a clean kind of image to everybody. Uh, In a way, I think that's why he married Donna. Although I did ask him that once. I said, why did you marry Donna? Why didn't you just live with her? He said, because I loved her and she wanted to get married. But I think it was image more than anything. Doesn't Um, being gay factor into that decision somewhere? Yes, exactly. I mean, Donna certainly knew that he was gay, or at least went to bed with men, bisexual at best. And he was bisexual. He had affairs with a few women. His uh, death must have been a horribly traumatic thing for you. 
Not really, because we'd been apart for many years by that time. And I hardly ever saw him in personal life. It was a very sad thing that he had to die. I mean, if, just think of what theater, a musical theater might have gotten out of him if, if he'd lived. But that was the same with, I mean, all the arts it was horrible. Costume designers, set designers, writers, actors. I mean, just awful how it was depleted with great talent gone. All because um, of AIDS. Yep. Well, Larry, I have to tell you how impressed I am with how gutsy and courageous you are. You went to New York City at 18 years old, and within a year you were in a Broadway show. You went to Europe and built a huge career there without even being able to speak the language. I mean, you were doing Voltaire in German, for God's sakes. I know. You've taken on massive projects and you have a sterling reputation. You're beloved in the industry. Do you get, I mean, deep down, do you really get how special you are, Larry? I guess not. I don't know. You know, I'm this old guy now who uh, had a really nice career. Um, well, you're writing a memoir, right? I am. And some of my personal experiences will certainly be in there. When uh, will it be finished? I'm not sure. My associate, Kim Jordan, who did many Vita companies with me, she lives in New York, and she's supposed to be coming out here for a week or so, the end of February or the beginning of March so that we can finish it. I've dictated over half of it. I just talk because I remember all this stuff very clearly. And once Hal and uh, Steve passed, I thought, well, I have to do this. I have to go through with it because I'm, I'm possessed so much information that nobody else knows. Because people have been telling me for years, you know, I tell my little stories about Madeline or Angela or whatever at dinner parties and, oh God, you've got to put that down in a book. You've got to write a book. And I was, a book? I'm not a writer to begin with. And they said- But you don't have to be a writer. You're a raconteur and you have stories that are part of show business history that need to be preserved. Because when you go, we don't want those stories to go with you. Yes, I know that's why I've decided I have to do it once Hal and Steve were gone. So will you come uh, back on our show to talk about the book when it comes out? Because we'd love to have you. I'd love to. Yes, of course. Well, Mr. Larry Fuller, to take a phrase from Avita, you truly are high flying adored. And it was oh, such you. an honor to have you on our show. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me and our viewers. It was a lot of fun. Thank you for asking me on. It was a pleasure. Our guest has been legendary choreographer and director Larry Fuller. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.